I want to speak uh, this afternoon on the topic of, I'm going to call it deliverance revival or crazy anointing, but we'll call it deliverance revival. That's just more, more domesticated. If you have your Bible, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 6. Then he arose and went into the house and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. So the background story, we're talking about Jehu. Jehu was the guy that the Lord has raised up for that time to combat a witch of that day. Her name is, you probably have heard of her, Jezebel. A witch, Jezebel, was only operating because of her spineless husband, Ahab. Because behind every Jezebel is Ahab. And Jehab, Jezebel can't operate in the presence of strong leadership. And so Ahab was tolerating her and Elijah was confronted a lot of times by Jezebel. He was confronting that kingdom but he never brought her down. Elisha took on the ministry from Elijah and part of Elijah's assignment was to bring Jezebel down and to end this whole Ahab uh, nonsense. Elijah, Elijah didn't do that so what he did is he anoints, he asked a servant to run to a commander named Jehu and says you're supposed to be the one to be the king of Israel and you're supposed to bring down Jezebel and pretty much vacuum this whole witchcraft off of the Israel's land. Now Jehu is not a prophet, he's just a military man. And in here what we see is that Jehu is not given by God weapons, he's not given by God a strategy, he's simply given by God anointing. If you're writing, taking notes, want to mention the first thing. God doesn't use us, He anoints us. It's important to understand that in the Christian culture, we use this word in a spiritual, not biblical, I believe. Lord, use me. You're not a napkin. Using something means you're using it, you're tossing it away. It's a means to an end. God anoints people because He loves them. He doesn't use them as a means to an end. So God anoints Jehu because anointing is what breaks the yoke. Not a theological degree, though we're not against degrees. Not knowledge, though we're not against knowledge. Not buildings, though we're not against buildings. Not finances, though we're not against finances. There are spiritual enemies that can only be confronted with spiritual powers. And the spiritual power that God has is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now the anointing is not just some mystical, weird, mysterious thing. It's the overflow of the life of God operating in the servant of God submitted to the will of God. Why am I highlighting this? Because right now the Lord is releasing at this hour in the United States an anointing, special grace. Though we're all called to the ministry of deliverance, but at this hour there is an anointing that's being released on what I call the Jehu generation. There were men and women of God before us, the prophets, the apostles, men and women who raised the dead, who were doing great exploits in the United States. In the United States, there was a healing revival that was there. There was also powerful prophets that were incredible. There was a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit in baptism of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street. There was a powerful repentance revival at Bronzeville. What's happening at this hour is there is a climax that is taking place. One is that the witchcraft in our generation, Jezebel has risen to her heights. Through her sorcery and through her witchcraft and because of the vacuum in our generation, our generation, the Gen Z and the millennials have went into spirituality, not into atheism. 
Whereas before our generation would reject God and walk away into some weird stuff and just reject everything with Jesus, today it's not like that. It's embracing everything and making a religion out of everything and saying there's many ways to God. Jesus was just a good teacher and you can have a spirit guide and you can talk to angels and you can have angel cards and you can look to stars to get your future. You can read horoscopes and everything. Our generation is more spiritual than any generation before us. All of that is an open door to witchcraft. And what the Lord is doing right now is this, is He's raising up young Jehus who will do what the previous guys did also. But if you look at the previous revivals in the United States, you will see one missing component in the mainline revival and that is deliverance. There was a lot of healing. There was a lot of baptism of the Holy Spirit. There was a lot of falling under the power of God. There's a lot of prophetic, but there's one thing. And if deliverance happened, it was, it was on a small scale. It was ridiculed. God is raising up a wild generation. God is raising up an unashamed, bold generation. He is pouring out His anointing of that generation to go head on against the witchcraft in our generation. God is raising a David against Goliath. God is raiding a Jehu against Jezebel. And they will bring down her witchcraft and her plan down in Jesus' name. And somebody say, I am that generation. And I believe the Lord is raising up Hungry Jen. I believe God is raising up the Isaiahs, the Daniels, the Ginny Weavers and the Catherine Craigs and all of those and so many more that is happening. The young people and because the television industry where it used to be before where there was these guards who didn't let people like us speak what we wanted to speak. But what the online did is open the gates for anybody who has a microphone to say something which is good and bad. The good thing is that we have a platform. The bad thing is anybody who has an opinion thinks they have a platform. And every, every heresy hunter in the, in the basement of the mama's house, you know, with the microphone and the camera feels like they're entitled and everybody needs to listen to them. But regardless of that, I do see that this Jehu generation that the Lord is raising up, young, bold, wild, and is going head on against the witchcraft of our generation. That's why Hungry Gen cannot be seeker sensitive. For those of you coming for the first time, what this means is that we can't just walk on eggshells and ignore the real problems and the real pain of people. Why? Because if 20 years ago the biggest problems were cigarettes and sleeping around in schools, today the biggest problems are channeling spirits, being molested and raped by demons in the night, people hearing voices in their head, and today we can't just bury our head in a sand and pretend this doesn't exist. Jezebel has to go down. And God used a Jehu to do that. Somebody shout, I'm a Jehu generation. Jehu was wild. In fact, when he was riding his chariot, they knew it was Jehu because they said he drives crazy. That's how some of you drive, literally. <laughs> Jehu driving. So the police officer pulls you over and said, Jehu anointing is upon me. <laughs> and then I'll give you a Jehu ticket as well. <laughs> he was driving like a madman. There was something about him that was wild. There was something about him that was unpredictable. There was something about him that people looked on the side and said, he is reckless. He is insane. I mean, you think Donald Trump's tweets were crazy. This guy lived like a mad, like he was just crazy. But honestly, it took the wildness to defeat the wickedness. For the wickedness, God will raise the wildness. Now, anointing makes the difference. What I want to mention right now to us is this. Don't aim for a title in the church. Titles is something that people give it to you, people can take it away from you. Anointing comes from God. When God gives it, no one can take it away. You can be like Joseph and get kicked out of the house of Joseph, uh, Potiphar, but they can't take your anointing. And you go to prison, you end up running prison. Sometimes in the church, you must understand every position in the church, every title in the church is temporary. One time, I was a sound man in the church and I'm so glad that I was asked to leave. But was I hurt? You bet I was hurt. My ego was hurt. My self-esteem was shattered. 
my future, my destiny was removed. Imagine when I got kicked out of the worship team as a lead worship leader of Hungry Gen. And I had grandmas that came up to me and they wanted to see if I had a CD. I was always wondering if they were deaf in their ear because they were like, you were so anointed in your singing. And I was like, can you even hear? Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't sing. I was speaking in tongues the whole time. And I was hurt when I was removed from that position. But then I discovered this thing about church culture and ju just overall is that if all you have is position, when you lose it, you feel like your world is destroyed. You end up being mad at your pastor. But if you cultivate intimacy with the Holy Spirit, you carry anointing. When you carry anointing, anointing does not need a title, a microphone, a spotlight and a camera. All anointing needs is a yoke to be broken, a sickness to be healed, a demon to be expelled and a gospel that needs to be preached to somebody. Come on somebody. And we need to bring anointing back in the house. Because when you're anointed, you're not going to be fighting for a position. You're going to be looking for a dark corner where you can be the light. Because anointing does not need a title. It needs a problem to solve. Anointing like Jehu, nobody gave him a position. Nobody gave him a throne. They simply gave him a Jezebel. Because when you're anointed, you're like, where is my Jezebel? Where is my Goliath? Where is my cancer to heal? Where is my blindness to heal? Where is that lost person that I need? to tell about Jesus? Where is that person that needs to be loved on? Where is that person that needs to be cherished and needs to be forgiven? Why? Because I am anointed. I am the light of the world. I don't need a spotlight. I am the light of the world. I don't need a microphone. The world is my microphone. I am anointed for this. That's why when you're anointed and the critics and the naysayers and I call them the spiritual mosquitoes who will come and attack the ministry of deliverance. If we don't give them attention and we stay in our anointing, we will become unstoppable. Because you can't stop an anointed man. You can't stop an anointed church. You cannot stop them. Why? Because they have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. No Jezebel, no demon in hell, no principality can stop the anointing of God because it has the power of God, the Spirit of God, the promise of God right behind it. Amen. The second thing that I want to highlight is that when Jehu was anointed, I want you to see this in, J in 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 18. So the horsemen went to meet him and said, thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, what have you to do with peace? Turn around. Somebody say turn around and follow me. Somebody say follow me. So the watchman reported saying, the messenger went to them, but is not coming back. The anointing of God is so precious and is so important. But the first thing that the anointing of God must do in this house and in our life and in the ministry and the revival of deliverance is what I call it to cause people to turn around and follow God. So the whoever devil sends our way, they don't come back. The first thing that Jehu we see did before he brought Jezebel down is that whoever they were sent, whoever was sent to him, he made them turn around and follow him. I call it the turnaround anointing. Jesus was anointed and the Bible says, the Spirit of God is upon me for he has anointed me. The first thing is to what? Preach the good news. We need anointing to preach. Not just communicate, uh, communicating ability, not just the skill to convince people because if we're not anointed to preach, we become motivational TED talkers. And we have enough of motivational speakers. God bless them, they have their place. But motivational speakers, they don't cause people to repent. They can bring relief, but they don't bring repentance. They can bring you to the altar and you can cry three tears and feel better about the fact that you were forgiven, but you don't change. Why? Because the anointing brings change. Jesus the Son of God who was anointed, His first message was not come to the altar and pray a sinner's prayer. His first message is repent for the kingdom of God is near. The message of Jesus Christ is still the message of repentance. It is not the message I raise my hand, let Jesus come into my heart. It is the message that I must be converted, I must repent and I must follow Jesus. What we have in our generation today, unfortunately, is we have a lot of people who confess they're bad, but they never get converted. We have people coming forward and praying a prayer that Jesus never told us actually to pray. The sinner's prayer, but they don't turn around. 
How do I know that? Because it's Christians in the United States who claim to believe in God who don't believe in absolute truth. It's Christians in the United States who claim to grow up in church who think abortion is woman's right. It's Christians in the United States who believe that a marriage is between whoever you love. How could it be? Very simple. You confessed your bad, you never got converted. Very simple. You encountered God and you had a pit stop, but you never turned around. It's very simple. You came to the front, but you were never discipled. That's why it grieves my heart today and I was telling to Zach and I'm telling that even to our churches that our desire is not just to count how many people got saved. We want to go from revival to reformation of our culture but we cannot do that unless we obey the commission of Jesus. Jesus' commission was not go into all the world and ask people to raise their hands. Go into all the world and make disciples and don't stop there. Teach them. Change their worldview. Change how they think. Change how they vote. Change how they see life. Make them. Teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. Wow Vlad, indoctrinating people. You bet. I don't want to be discipled by CNN. I don't want to be discipled by Fox News. I don't want TikTok to indoctrinate our generation. I don't want 77 year olds to be confused about their gender. I don't want to see a 17 year old guy in a woman's bathroom in the local gym. But how, how is that possible on our watch? It's very simple. And some of you, I saw you rolling your eyes at me right now. I'm coming for you. What we have is this, is that motivational preaching produces relief, not repentance. And when we simply come to church to lose the burden of guilt instead of lose our life and be totally reprogrammed by the truth of the gospel. But Pastor Vlad, but the gospel is offensive. Yet the Bible warns us it's offensive. Because the, the gospel is offensive. The Bible is narrow. These Christians are narrow-minded. Not narrow-minded. We just are on, on, on a narrow path. But I'll be honest with you. I have walked in the trails before in different trails. I would rather walk in the narrow path to heaven than in a highway to hell. The Bible is the Word of God. Jesus is God and fully man. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Abortion is killing a baby. It's not nobody's right. Homosexuality is a sin. That's what the Bible teaches us. Now if you're coming for the first time today, you're like, whoa, I'm drinking from the fire hose. Yes. Our desire is not just to make converts. People who confess they're bad. And a lot of us, this idea of salvation is me saying all the bad stuff to God and I'm sorry, comes from Catholicism. Catholics perfected the, the, the thing of confession. Confession booths. For a lot of you, when you were in Catholics, were nothing more than a garbage can. You know what a garbage can does? That's where you throw garbage. And so you sin and you have a priest on the payroll whose job is to pick up your garbage. So you come and you say, Father, I have sinned. What did you do this week? This, 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 this. Well, you do, do this and then you come back again next week to do exactly the same thing. In fact, if you would stop sinning, he would lose his job. So guess what we do? We bring that into our walk with Christ where we treat Christ instead of an altar be a place of death, it, it's, it's a trash can. Now imagine you would take that into your marriage and you cheat on your spouse and you come and you say, I am so sorry. And then you say, man, it feels so good to be able to tell you that. That I was unfaithful to you. I feel like a burden is lifted. I carried this sin for so long. Now that the burden is lifted that I told you I'm sorry. Your wife, your wife, let's say your wife or your husband will say, wait, wait, wait. I don't care that your burden is lifted. You're in trouble. We broke an intimacy. Yeah, but you should forgive me. Yeah, I forgive you, but I just don't trust you anymore. We have a broken relationship now. We have a broken intimacy. And let's say you go do it again, only to come back and say, I'm sorry. And she's going to say, well, the thing about it is that your sorry doesn't cut it. Because don't tell me you're sorry. I'm not your priest. 
my relationship is not a garbage can. This is a relationship and we can't be together if you don't change. What? You expect me to change? It's the way I was born. I can't. Well, we can't be together. See, but if we present that today to Christians, legalism, 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 control, works, salvation by works. One inch in theology and that already flags legalism in your mind. What, is the, what about the Bible saying that work out your salvation with fear and trembling? What, a, what about the Bible saying that he who's a friend with the world is an enmity with God? What about that? So I really want to challenge us where God is taking our church to is this is that is you're either with God or you're not with Him. I understand this might be a little bit hard for those of you that are coming in for the first time but honestly can we be honest that's exactly what you expect out of Christians. One of the reasons you have a problem with Christians is because they're fake. One of the reasons some of you left Christianity is because of very thing that I'm preaching right now. Is that you do not like that in other people, why do you tolerate it in yourself? The Bible says that the salt is what the world needs us to be. Salt doesn't have to be the majority, it can be the minority as long as it's salt. But if we lose our saltiness, guess what happens to us? We get trampled on the ground. One of the reasons Christianity is trampled underground in our culture today is because we lost our saltiness. We don't need to be the majority in Tri-Cities to make a difference. We just need to be the real deal. Even if we are the minority, we can go from revival to reformation if we're the real deal. So turn around. That's why discipleship is so important. That's why coming to church is not enough. You got to be connected. You got to be trained. Oh, yeah, so all the garbage gets out. So all the stuff that you picked up from your politicians and you picked up from your news anchors and you made them into your theologians get removed. And we go to the Bible, well the Bible is outdated. No, it's not outdated. Your life is just outdated. It needs to be updated by the renewing of our mind. Amen. And I want you to see this is that Jehu was anointed. Jehu goes in, these guys come, they're like, who, 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 who do you think? Are you coming with peace? And Jehu says, listen. Uh, stop this nonsense. Turn around and get behind me. <laughs> and the Bible says the guy turned around and went behind him. See, it's not just about having somebody pray a prayer. It's somebody changing the course of their direction. It's not just a teenager coming on Friday or coming on Thursday in school and say, hey, I just want to accept Jesus. Why? Because I struggle with weed. No, it's them turning their life around and saying, now I follow Jesus. Not on Twitter or on Instagram, but actually in life, I follow Jesus. The third thing that I want you to see is Jehu, when he's anointed, he has a turnaround effect about him. John the Baptist had a similar thing. He turned people's hearts to God. He turned the hearts of the Father to the children and turned the foolishness of people to the wisdom of the righteous. But I want you to see that the thirdly is that Jehu goes straight for the queen, the, the evil queen, the witch, and he confronts her. He does not conform to her. The third thing is that, and I believe this is where the Lord is raising an army right now, that we are not going to conform to things God has called us to conf confront. We're not going to make a covenant with that which we were anointed to conquer. So therefore stop saying that your homosexual tendencies is who you are. As a Christian, it's what you're anointed to get rid of. Yeah, if you're not a Christian, honestly, yeah, that's probably who you are. You're born a sinner, you're gonna die a sinner, and you're gonna go to the lake of fire because you're separated from God. You can't save yourself. No therapy, no counseling, no medicine can save you. Only Jesus can save you. But the moment you become a Christian, you come to Jesus Christ, something begins to happen. He gives you a new nature. That means you can no longer identify with your issue. You identify with your Savior. That means you must understand the anger is not just part of being Irish. The anger is part of you being a soldier and destroying the spirit of anger in your life. You got to confront that anger. You can't conform to that anger. Now you cannot have your children and your wife walking around because you're angry and they're hiding. No, no, no. Nobody should be conforming to your anger. You should be confronting the spirit of anger. 
You can't be now still switching therapists because it's been 20 years you've been fighting with that depression. Nothing wrong with therapy. Nothing wrong with medicine. Nothing wrong with counseling. But if they're not dealing with your Jezebel, you were anointed to confront Jezebel in your life. To confront fear in your life, to confront depression in your life, to confront that demonic spirit in your life, that generational curse that runs from one generation to another, it must stop with you. Stop conforming to it. Stop domesticating it. Rise up and declare a war against it. When you do your daily devotionals, praise God for His goodness. Confess your sin. Repent from your sin. Declare God's promises and then turn your gun against the devil. Speak to the mountain and it will be moved. Prophesy Jeremiah. Prophesy Ezekiel to your dry bones. Begin to speak a word of God. So many people say, well, pastor, you know, I have this demon that's attacking me. And I said, why are you not attacking back? Well, I was hoping you can help me. You were anointed to confront. The Bible says, submit to God and resist the devil. So when that comes on you, you come against it. So one of the things that we do in our church that maybe some of you have a hard time understanding but I'm giving you a, a biblical understanding of where this is coming from is we do warfare prayers. Now warfare prayers, we're not screaming at God. God is not deaf. And we're not screaming at you. So when we're going to be screaming today, it's not at you. It's whatever you dragged into this place that you want out. <laughs> That's what we're screaming and you should be screaming too. We, 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 I don't need to scream. You have never had a dog or children. Now typically you just ask them nicely. Sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down I said. <laughs> My dog, he understands. Sit down. Quiet. But sometimes he doesn't. So then you, you raise the voice. Uh, you know, we don't need to raise the voice. 100%. Demons don't respond to the volume. But your authority shows a lot when you are firm versus when you are soft. We're not dealing with the Lord. We're dealing with the enemy. And the Lord has given us the authority. I want you to see that Jehu did not come to the Jezebel's house and say, Lord, could you send the plague and take her out? Jezebel was confronted by Jehu. Elisha didn't do that and Elijah didn't do that. Jehu did that. Are you going to do that? Or are you going to keep getting, getting people to keep medicating your spiritual problem? Keep giving you a different name or are you going to confront it? You're going to say, no, this thing, I'm confronting it. I'm standing against it. And this can happen in church today. Why not at church? Why, why, why is the church supposed to avoid that? Oh, why, we, we come, it's, it's supposed to be quiet and, and nice. Cemetery is quiet and nice. You, 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 uh, that, there's no life there. Oh, this is just, 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 just too crazy. That's fine. You said that or the demon? Because you're, once you get free, praise God. But the demons do not want that. And so I want to let you know, when we're going to be praying today, when that is going to happen, Pretty much what I mentioned at the conference. Some of you have not seen this before and this maybe is confusing. I'll give you a little help. You're coming to a Normandy beach when all you have known is a Universal Studios. And that's why when you see stuff like that you're like that's not supposed to be happening at church. No just you've been at the churches where you've never been shown that but that's Jesus did that disciples did that. The power of God followed. Signs followed. Demons were expelled. People were healed. People were touched and that's exactly what church is about. And if that's not what your version of the church is, I would really reconsider what kind of church were you looking for. Keep shopping. There's a lot of wonderful churches there who, who will not allow that to be seen. Not at Hungry Gen. Why? Because Jezebel has to go down. You have to be free, healed, walk for the glory of God. And God didn't give us the anointing to conform. He gave us the anointing to confront. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Confront spiritual forces and darkness in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the last two things is this is where it's going to hit us home. The fourth thing that I want you to see is 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30. It says, And when Jehu had come to Jezreel, 
Jezreel. Jezebel heard of it and she put on, she put paint on her eyes. So guys, makeup is biblical. It started with Jezebel. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That, that's an example of taking scripture out of context. She put on paint on her eyes. I could see parents telling their daughters already, Jezebel put that on her eyes. You're putting that on your eyes. She put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through the window. The fourth point that I want you to, to write this down is Jezebel will try to put a hook of intimidation into you. But when it fails, she will put on a lipstick. Jezebel attacked Elijah with intimidation. But she attacked, I believe, Jehu through putting on makeup. Elijah was threatened. She didn't want to kill Elijah. Because if you have any common sense, you know that if you want to take somebody out, you don't send a messenger, you send a hitman. She didn't send a hitman against Elijah. She sent a messenger to threaten him that he's going to die. This wasn't serious. If she would really be serious to take him out, why send the message? Just take him out. She didn't take him out, never planned to take him out, couldn't take him out. She simply wanted to scare him. And you have to understand one thing about the enemy. When the devil threatens to kill you, he's lying. He would have killed you if he could. All he can do is scare you. When the devil tells you, you're not going to make it. When the devil tells you, I'm going to take you out, it's going to be an accident. You're going to die from this disease. And he begins to replay horror stories in your head. I want to remind you today is that the, the enemy's number one tool is fear. He can't do anything without fear opening the door. And all you have to do is stop running from fear, confront fear and keep going forward after God. Elijah, he ran from Jezebel because of fear. She never intended to take him out. God planned to take him to heaven through a chariot, not because of a hitman. And so the enemy cannot take you out before God's time if you stand in faith and you walk after God. But Jehu, you can't put a hook in Jehu. The guy's wild. The guy's Rambo. Jason Bourne and John Wick put together. This guy's literally like a biblical avenger. The guy's ruthless. He turned the demonic temples into toilets. This guy was so crazy. He wiped all the prophets of Baal, took all of the sons of Ahab out of circulation. So guess what Jezebel does? She changes her tactic. Instead of putting a hook into him, she puts a bait in front of him. Because many men of courage are a lot more aware and cautious of fear and intimidation and a lot more guard down against the lipstick and lash, eyelashes and so many other stuff. Or women. It's not just only Jezebel doesn't have a gender. She puts the makeup on and I want to just speak to people who are in the ministry, people who are in deliverance ministry. I want to speak to people who are who are a businessman, especially successful men who have conquered trials and tribulations, rose through the top. You have conquered alcoholism, you've conquered maybe drugs and something else and you're finally on the top. Be weary to get overconfident. Because you're not attacked with that which you were delivered from, it does not mean there is no bait that's in front of you already. Walk in the fear of God. Don't fall prey to demonic lies and demonic agendas. Maybe things in your family are not as they used to be. Maybe you got a lot of children, your spouse is not paying attention to you and you got an old joker from 20 years ago on Facebook messaging you an old flame and you feel like finally they're giving you the attention and now you're getting this feeling that God wants you out of this marriage to pursue your own happiness. It's a lipstick of Jezebel and you're kissing it. Walk away from her. Walk away from her. Can somebody say amen? You know, when I was young and bad looking, not a lot of people wanted me. And now lately, it's been weird. I got all of these crazies out of nowhere who started to believe that I'm supposed to be their husband. 
If I can only read to you the messages that my wife reads because she checks all of my messages. I mean, I'm talking about from people to like, hey, when your wife dies. And my wife is like, I won't say the words because we're live, but, um, but people who are like, hey, God told me you married the wrong person, but he's giving you a second chance uh, to leave her and to make the right decision. Yeah, I mean, I knew that there was a lot of people who have mental illnesses, but I knew there were a lot of people who have demons. I knew there were a lot of people who are very confused in their head, but until the online ministry started to take off, I, I am shocked. And, but honestly, the devil does have a plan. And this is why we need to have not only strong marriages, we need to have strong communities and we need to have strong convictions. Because it's one thing to drive out demons, but it's another thing to fall prey to debate. How many ministries fall prey to the money problems, to the sexual problems and immorality and deliverance ministries are no different. Jezebel put that bait in front of Jehu, but I love the fact that Jehu didn't entertain the thoughts. He didn't say, hey girl, let's come down. You know, like he didn't try to flirt to convert. He didn't try to win her over to the Lord, do a deliverance on her. He pretty much said, hey girl, you're going down and there is no parachute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not talking about that you speak like that to women. I'm saying that we speak like that to the spirits behind women or men. Amen. For some of you who came out of that lifestyle, I just want to warn you and encourage you to walk in holiness and in righteousness. Because sometimes when you are on the guard against drugs, because that's all you dealt with, you might not realize that the devil has a lipstick on the side. And because you're paying attention to freedom on this side so much, you're guarded in this area because you're taking heed to this area. And there's another area that can lure you in. That's one of the reasons we have to have have the fear of the Lord, not just know that God loves us, but to walk in the reverence of God and to walk in the community that we have brothers and sisters and our spouses who can cover our blind spots so that we can stay protected and stay blessed by God. Amen. The last thing that I want to mention and that is when Jehu died, when Jezebel died in 2 Kings chapter 10 verse 31 it says this, but Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord, God of Israel, with all his heart. I want you to rise. <sighs> Jezebel never brought Jehu down. You know who brought Jehu down? Jehu. Lord spoke to my heart. My personal word for me and I want to release it to you. When God gets the demons out, your biggest problem is not going to be them. It's going to be you. When God removes toxic people out of your life, your biggest problem is not going to be them. It's going to be you. And most of us were way better bringing down Jezebel than bringing down Jehu. We're way better because when Jezebel attacks, we're in prayer. We're going to pay a $2,000 ticket to come to Tri-Cities, rent a hotel for two nights, fast for three days. I'm fighting the spirit. I'm fighting the spirit. But then when that spirit is out, you still have a fight. You know who you have a fight with? You. And most of us, when it comes to a fight with us, we fold like paper. And I have a word for somebody in this room. You're better at war than you are at your walk. Jehu, the Bible says, did not take heed to his walk. Because he was so busy taking heed to his war. Oh, and he was successful in his war. But he was weak in his walk. Husbands, how is your walk with your wife? Parents, how is your walk with your children? How is your walk with your health? See, it's a walk, not a run. And most of us, we love bullets flying. Fire, fire, praise God. And when all of that is out, we're like, we don't know what to do. It's like what happens with a lot of men who come from military. They don't know how to be a civilian. They don't know how to live normally. Because they're always ready for that tension and that, that stress and that pressure and it puts, pulls the best out of them. But when you remove that, they don't know what to do with themselves. They feel lost. 
They're looking for that thing again to do something with the gun, to do something with, with to do something to scratch that itch. And, and spiritual warfare is a similar way. We love the ministry of deliverance, but who we are? I remember one time I wrote this in my notebook and I said this, I'm not a demon slayer, I'm a disciple. I am not a deliverance minister, I am God's son. Monday through Friday and on Sunday, I'm a Christian who follows Jesus. I want to walk the walk in the way that when I am 60, when I am 70, if God, the Lord tarries and gives me life and I am 80, I want my walk to be as good as my war. Not just my war, but my walk. And Jehu, it's sad. Jezebel the witch couldn't take him out. Ahab, the spineless king, couldn't take him out. All of their 70 crazy children couldn't take him out. And guess who took Jehu out? Jehu. Deliverance without discipleship will lead to disappointment. Be a disciple. Join a local church. Join a small group. Submit to leadership. Prioritize accountability. Because it's more than just about fun and games, fire, anointing, being zapped with the power of God. Oh, demons came out. Yeah, but you didn't come out. You're still there. <laughs> and the fruit of the Spirit is not, it's self-control. It's not God controlling you. It's you learning to control you. And there is no prayer line we offer we can get rid of you. I mean, there is one we could offer, but it is illegal. And it's not biblical. You can't get rid of you. You got to learn to live with you. You got to learn to humble you. You got to learn to make you read the Bible. You, there is no prayer line. There is a prayer life for you. Amen. Let's speak that over our church. That we don't find our identity in deliverance. We find our identity in Jesus. That we are disciples of Jesus Christ who do deliverance. We're Jehus who slay Jezebels. But we also know how to walk with the Lord faithfully day in and day out. We know how to pray. We know how to read the Bible. We know how to treat our spouses correctly. We know how to love Jesus. We know how to live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday keeping ourselves in the joy of the Lord. I don't need somebody to constantly motivate me. I can choose to be joyful. I can choose to feed myself in God's Word and I can choose to walk with the Lord. And I can tell you one thing, doing deliverance, seeing healing and even building a church, the hardest part is not that. The hardest part is every day living like a disciple. Because there's no cameras, there's no tweets, there's no posts, there's no likes, there's no lights there. You're simply you and the Lord and your family. And that is where the real fruit, that is where the real challenge is. Because that's where you're motivated by your spiritual maturity, not external pressure. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to hungrygen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.